want to hit the record. All right, perfect. We're starting. I'll, I'll share my screen. Right. Can everyone see that all right? Yep. Yeah, you see the presentation? Perfect. Wonderful. Um, let me just do this for me. Wonderful. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, we are recording this session so that it can be distributed amongst the participants who signed up to an earlier session. Uh, let me just start by saying apologies for the bit of a mix up. There was some um, misunderstanding on the organizational side of things, and uh, but we didn't want to let this opportunity go by. And we uh, wanted to um, do the presentation together and then we'll distribute it uh, to the people who might be interested in, in, in viewing the recordings. Um, Let's start with the first thing, and that is introductions. Uh, my name is Anna Mayansa. I am the Secretary General of Aurora, uh, and I lead the Aurora Central Office, which is located in Amsterdam on the campus of the Vrije Universiteit. And welcome to our session, which is uh, titled Tackling the SDGs, How Innovative International Collaboration in Higher Education Can Contribute to Tackling These SDGs. So with this session, my pan panel members and I just want to demonstrate how our universities as being part of a network of international collaborating universities work together to contribute to achieving the SDG goals. And we'll dive into some practical and specific examples of academic and scientific projects through which we do that. In addition to myself, we have four other speakers whom I'll introduce in a minute. But I first wanted to just walk you through how we are going to run this session. Um, I will start with an introduction into Aurora, what we are, what we do, um, and um, we are both a network and an alliance, and I'll explain that difference. And the goal of my bit is to give you a bit of a context for the projects that we will discuss, and those projects are societal entrepreneurship skills, digital society, develop a metric for monitoring for, for impact, apologies, and engaging society in environmental sustainability. God, my, my speech has left me. Each presenter will have about 15 minutes um, and that will mean that in total we'll probably be around an hour and 15, maybe an hour and a half, depending how much time everyone needs. Had we done this live, we would have had the opportunity for questions, but it's a recording, so we hope you'll find this useful. And of course, if you do have any specific questions, we will be very happy um, if you reach out to us and uh, we can ask the organizers to share our information in case anyone is interested. Then my panel members, uh, allow me to introduce them to you. Uh, first off, we have Kai Hockertz. He's a professor in social entrepreneurship at Copenhagen Business School, CBS. Um, in his role as academic director of responsible management education, he leads SBS's curriculum change initiative, which aims to anchor responsible management education across uh, CBS's curriculum. Kai's primary, primary research focus is on corporate sustainability strategies and social entrepreneurship. And Kai will be covering what we call the seismic part of today's uh, panel presentation, which is the social entrepreneurship and innovation skills for measuring impact competencies. And then mouthful. It's a tool that measures where, whether the Aurora universities uh, are equipping their students with the skills and mindsets to really address critical social challenges. So I'll leave it at that because Kai will have much more to say about this and can be explaining it much, much better than I can. Then we have Jaap Gordijn, he's the founder and managing partner of The Value Engineers, uh, a company designing peer-to-peer -peer business models for technologies such as blockchain. He'll probably be able to tell you more about that. I have no idea what blockchain is. Um, also, he's an associate professor of innovative e-business at the uh, uh, Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. And Jaap, Jaap, sorry Jaap, Jaap will discuss Aurora's work on the Digital Society Programme, which will educate young professionals with the ca uh, capabilities to tackle complex societal, environmental and technologies, uh, technological challenge challenges addressing the SDGs. Then our other speakers are Maurice van der Weesten, who works as Innovation Manager Research Service at the University Library of the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. He's also chair of the Research Impact Coordination Group for the Dutch Royal and University Libraries. 
And Maurice will discuss the SDG dashboards for education and research. And these examine the references made to the research performed by Aurora uh, universities, the Aurora members in policy documents from national and local governments. And again, Maurice can explain this much better than me. So I'll move on to our final speaker today is Dario Minervini. He's a researcher at the University of Naples, Federico Secundo, and he teaches environmental sociology at the Department of Social Sciences. His research interests are focused on environmental and economic sociology, gender studies, and qualitative methods. And Dario today will discuss our work on engaging society um, in environmental sustainability. So really topics around transdisciplinarity and translating policy programs uh, onto environmental sustainability. And it's really about overcoming those traditional boundaries uh, between the disciplines in academia and uh, society. Then as I already hinted, Aurora is a network and an alliance. And I'll kick off with some explanation about Aurora um, as the network side of things. Yep. So Aurora is a network of uh, like-minded, comprehensive research intensive universities across Europe that are committed to excellent science and education that really have an impact on society and really working together to contribute to achieving the SDG goals. The main goal, um, the main goal and aim of Aurora is to match academic excellence with societal relevance. So the Aurora network really is a platform for university leaders and administrators to learn from and with each other. And Aurora has a history of engagement with our local communities and really are committed to uh, a really good beneficial so social impact on our communities. So the priorities of Aurora, the priority areas, I would say, of Aurora are diversity, inclusion, um, societal relevant and impact of research, student engagement and innovation in teaching and learning. We operate as a high trust platform, really want to work with each other and learn from each other. But, you know, not just what's going well and all the success stories, but also what are the challenges. Um, as a partnership of European universities, we really feel that we have uh, a, cont a contribution to make to society to make sure that um, the well being of the European continent is something that we work on. Originally formed in 2016, um, the Aurora has now entered in a new phase of more intensive collaboration thanks to the flagship program of the European Commission, the European University Initiative, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So our members are located all across Europe, as you can see. Um, one of our membership criteria is to have one university member per higher education system so that our members can really speak freely amongst each other without any competition uh, between universities of the same system. So as you can see, we've got uh, from Iceland to Italy and from the UK to the Czech Republic. Then the network is a membership organization and we offer several services to our members, um, you know, forums in which our members can share best practices and learn from each other, uh, conversations with experts uh, in their fields, representation in um, the EU on higher education and research policy, and the network also really has a distinct global outreach. Then as promised, the next part is the alliance. And for those who don't really 100% know what the European University Initiative is, I kind of need to give a little bit of background about this. So I hope you'll allow me to give a two minutes, maybe a little bit more policy background on, on, on the European University Initiatives. So the European University Initiative uh, was something that was um, really coined by President Macron, but it of course is uh, steeped in EU policy. So what I wanted to do was just give you a quick overview of the policies that are relevant to us in the European University uh, Initiative or the alliances. As you can see, the EU for the coming years have four major uh, priorities, which is protecting citizens and freedom, developing a strong and vibrant economic base, building a climate neutral, green, fair and social Europe and promoting European interests and values on the global stage. Now that translates into the six priorities you see below there. These are the priorities for the commission. And for those who don't know, the commission is actually the body that creates the policies. So as you can see, a lot of these policies are quite uh, in line with what's happening in terms of um, 
uh, directions of, of primarily Western uh, uh, governments and, you know, an economy that, that works for everyone and uh, democracy and Green Deal and digital transformation. These are really big topics, I think, across the world. And you see it uh, reflected in the priorities for the Commission as well. Then what does that mean for policies on higher education and research? So these four policies are the policies that are important for um, education institutions. Uh, the European education area and the European strategy for universities really form the policy basis for European university alliances. And um, to really now make the switch to what are European university alliances, these are really groups of universities working together funded by the EU in a pilot way, we're really piloting what we're doing to create a new and more intensive way of collaborating between universities internationally to really pave the way for the European universities of the future. We are one of 42, I believe, alliances, um, and we are funded, as I said, by the EU, and the funding happens through the Erasmus Plus and Horizon Europe program. So, so those are the tools with which uh, the European university initiatives actually get funded. Then what does the EU want these alliances to achieve? What does it want us to do? Um, these are some, I didn't list all of them because there were too many, but these are some of the objectives uh, for the European universities to really promote European values. As you'll see, when you go through these objectives, they are very much linked to the overarching objectives I shared on, on the higher EU level. So what they want to do, promote European values, improve quality performance and attractiveness and international competitiveness of European universities, really on a global scale. It's an institutionalized cooperation. So it's more than just a couple of joint programs, but it's really institutions working together, uh, creating a European inter-university campus. So what you should envision there is that in the far, far, far future, um, what, uh, what the EU would like to happen in this case is that a student could start its, uh, their degree at, let's take our alliance as an example, at the University of Amsterdam, stay there for a year, then say, okay, I want to do uh, six months at the Copenhagen Business School, and then another six, six months at the University of Innsbruck, and another year in the University of Naples of uh, Federico Secundo, and then uh, that all together will still be the equivalent of one full degree that you would normally do at one university. So the EU also wants these alliances to become role models for European higher education transformation so that other uh, universities who are not part of the alliances can still learn from these alliances. And um, also very important is the inclusion and excellence um, uh, balance and the synergies between education and research. Then of course, these are the EU policy sides, but then what is important for Aurora? And Aurora has, the European University has really three uh, strategic priorities. Uh, the first is to equip graduates with the skills and mindset to become social entrepreneurs and innovators to really that when they're graduated, they can have the skills to tackle these big societal challenges. The second is to make collaboration with external stakeholders and students really regular practice across the board, so education and research and outreach and to also lead, as, uh, lead by example as sustainability pioneers and contribute to addressing the SDGs. So as you see, SDGs are pretty much ingrained in everything that we do. Then I'm almost finished, I promise, because I'm sure you're much more interested in the really technical um, uh, examples and scientific examples we've got lined up for you today. But then to make the link between what the Aurora priorities are, priorities are and what our projects are actually doing, I wanted to give you a couple of examples of the actual work and deliverables we're doing. So you've heard all about policy and the, strat the strategy, but what does it actually mean in practice uh, for work? And I've chosen the examples, which you then translate to the four specific um, uh, projects that will be presented after my presentation. So for social transformation, it's really all about making sure that our student population reflects the talent in the communities we serve and about strengthening the evidence base of education with big data analysis. So what we have developed, for example, is a definition of the future student population, like what kind of students do we want to attract? How do we serve society by doing that? And on the other hand, an analysis of the obstacles to admission, enrollment and successful completion of the studies. 
Then another one is transforming education from the inside to ensure students become social entrepreneurs and innovators. And we do this by working on um, equipping and supporting uh, academic teachers to teach for societal impact. So what does it mean for them as a teacher to teach in a way that you uh, teach for societal impact? But also by developing a framework of academic and personal competence a student should have acquired by the time they graduate. And this is one of the things we will be discussing today. Another one is sustainability pioneers and the SDGs. So really what we want to do is make the SDGs a leading narrative in education and research. And we aim to achieve that through, for example, for example, our SDG research and education dashboard, which again is one of the projects that we will be discussing today. Then last but certainly not least, everything we do, we try and apply that in what we call four pilot domains. So these are communities of experts in four domains that are really transdisciplinary and to produce joint courses and programs and, and laying the ground for research collaborations. And these four domains are sustainability and climate change, health and well-being, culture, diversity and inclusion, and digital society and global citizenship. And digital society is also something that will be addressed more in depth as well. So this was really it for me. I just wanted to give you a lay of the land, of the network and the alliance of what we do and what kind of policies are behind what we do. Um, and I will now be uh, switching to my colleagues to start the um, start the presentations of the uh, practical examples. And if I am not mistaken, the first one up is. Let me just go through my Kai. Right, yeah, Kai, you were the yes. first. One. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Let me start sharing the screen here. Thank you very much. And um, before I jump into the presentation for today, I just wanted to show uh, you something here uh, that we have also developed as part of the Aurora project. And uh, this is actually what we call the social business model panorama. So if, uh, if you're teaching students on social innovation, social entrepreneurship, you may find this interesting. You see here, here's a list of student projects um, that nearly all of them have been developed in one of our classes. So this is basically an exercise. Uh, I'll, I'm going to show you the first one here, Fungi. Uh, that's actually a group of students who wants to grow uh, uh, mushrooms and basically to replace, uh, uh, replace animal-based uh, protein. Uh, and what you can see here on the right-hand side, this software allows the students to describe the problems uh, that they're uh, working on, uh, their team, the solution, and so on and so on, uh, the value proposition, all the way down to a fundraising pitch where they say, hey, if we to do this, we need funding for this, please support us here. Now, what's interesting about this is that it is not just something the students work on, but it is very interactive. And let me just show this to you. So we see here, um, here you can actually see the team. Those are four students of ours who have worked on this. Uh, one of the students is from uh, the University of Innsbruck, one of the Aurora uh, partners, another one is from CBS, and so on. Uh, but I can also look at the followers. And what you see here is there's two people following this project. One is Vincent, another of our students, and Anne Karen, who is also in the call here today, who is one of the co-teachers. And what the software allows you is to see what your students are doing in real time. The students can see each other. So you can click on this overview here and scroll down and you see all these great projects that have been developed by your students. And you can compare to projects that other students have developed. So for example, uh, just now in August, we did a course uh, with the University of Innsbruck at something called the Alpbach Forum, uh, where students have come forward with ideas uh, early in July. We did a course here at CBS, actually two courses at CBS, where students from all the nine Aurora universities came and have developed projects. And um, later in uh, this year, in October, we will have a course in, uh, in Napoli, where again, there will be a hackathon and students develop ideas and so on and so on. Now, so much for the background. Uh, this, by the way, is available. Uh, anybody who wants to use this, uh, so Aurora is an open network. So if you're interested to use this, just let us know and you can try this out. It's for free to, to the professors. It's for free to the students. So it's easy to use. Uh, and, and if you want to know more, just send an email to aurora at cbs.dk, aurora, like our network, at cbs, like Copenhagen Business School, .dk, and then we're going to tell you more about this. But now let me come to the main part of our presentation today, right? So um, 
what we want to know is whether the kind of education that we do at our rural schools actually has an impact. Um, and when I say impact, the, the, the theme, the, the main story above Aurora is that we want to educate change makers. So we want our students to learn the skills to become change makers in society, uh, to identify the salient societal problems that are out there, uh, to be creative and come up with solutions to those problems and actually implement those solutions, make them work in practice. That is our goal. And this is not just for the, uh, the management programs. This is for all the study programs that we have. Our students who study physics or engineering or nursing and so on. So we want them to learn during their, stu their studies what do I need in terms of skills in order to be able, <coughs> I apologize for this, I had COVID recently, so I might be coughing during my, my talk a little bit. So that, that, that to learn the skills and competences that you need to engage in social entrepreneurship and social innovation. Now, uh, we are just halfway, or actually two thirds more or less through our first phase of the Aurora project, what we call the pilot phase. And what we have developed in this phase is something that we call the social entrepreneurship and innovation scales to measure impact competence. We, we shorten this to seismic, like a seismic competence. Um, that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, so what are the competences needed in order to become the societal change maker? Uh, and we would argue that every student at every Aurora University, indeed actually every student anywhere in the world should learn these basic competencies. Now, of course, some disciplines will focus more on certain competencies than others, but overall, we hope that our students, when they leave our universities, they are able to implement those competencies. And what we've done is we've gone out, we've done a, a literature review of 118 studies. We've looked at what people have written about uh, social innovation, what are the competencies that are needed, and we have we have studied those pre-existing tools and realized that there is three main dimensions that are being covered. So the first one is what we call impact competencies. So the competence to actually identify problems, uh, find out what has to be addressed. And this breaks down into four sub-elements. And these sub-elements are, first of all, an analytical competence. So to be able to think critically, to think out of the box, to question and, and ask, why are we engaging in the practices that we're engaging in today? Uh, you also need a competence to measure this. We call this impact assessment competence. So the ability to measure the impact that we are creating. Uh, a third element is the normative competence. And that by that, we mean to be able to make a moral judgment and importantly, also to express this. Uh, this is often referred to as giving voice to values. So we want our students to be able in the workplace, in society, to step up and say, here are my values. And I think what we're doing here is not aligned with my values. Right? This doesn't necessarily mean that their values should be respected, but at the very least, you should know what your, what your values are and you should be able to express them. And finally, the fourth element of impact competence is what we call impact commitment. So that when the students leave our Aurora universities, they are fully committed to creating impact in society, that this is an important part of their personality and of their, uh, their career path that they're aiming for. The second dimension is what we call entrepreneurship competencies. And what we have identified here is, again, four elements. First of all, of course, you need to find a problem-solving competence. So you need to be able, once you have identified a problem, to come up with solutions to this, to be an innovator, to come up with innovative, creative solutions. But as we know from a lot of innovations, the, uh, the, uh, the first ideation is not enough. You also need to identify opportunities for how to implement this, basically how to turn this into a business model, right? So we, we, we have these ideas of inventing the light bulb, yes, but how do you actually then sell that? How do you sell electricity to customers? How do you build up something that is an opportunity that people can use? Uh, thirdly, we want our students to uh, be confident to act under, under uncertainty. So action under uncertainty means that we want to make sure that in a uncertain, risky environment, our students are able to make decisions and to act upon their convictions. 
And finally, we need future thinking. We need to be able to think ahead, not just 12 months or, or two years, but five years, 10 years, a generation to understand how these problem solutions that we come up with will affect future generations and actually lead to a sustainable future. So we have impact competencies and we have entrepreneurship competencies. And there is a third element in here that we have identified uh, that we think is very important to make those two competencies work. So the third dimension is what we call engagement competencies. Engagement competencies allow you to implement your impact competence and to implement your entrepreneurship competencies. And what you need here is the following things. You first of all need to be able to take the perspective of somebody else. This is referred to as perspective taking competence. Sometimes this is referred to as empathy, right? If we, if we want to find out that people are, uh, are having uh, uh, problems and to understand those problems, we need to be able to take their perspective. Why is a homeless person homeless? Right? What, what are, what, what, how is the way they see the world? Uh, secondly, we need a participatory competence. Social innovation requires that many stakeholders are included in the discussion, that this is not a top-down driven thing, which is only uh, implemented by, uh, by one singular inventor, but you need to bring in your stakeholders. So for that, you have to have a participatory competence that doesn't just uh, ask those stakeholders what they want, but actually gives them a, a stake in it, possibly even a democratic governance structure here so that people from all around society can contribute. Now, but obviously you will understand that different stakeholders have different expectations. So you also need something that we refer to as tension management here. You need to be able to deal with the tensions of one of your customer groups. And on the other hand, one of your, your beneficiary group, the people you want to benefit through your innovation. And finally, and this is very important for us, you need the ability to diffuse this innovation. You need to be able to not hold on as many entrepreneurs do and keep this idea secret and hide it behind uh, patents. But if you really want social innovation, you want other people to pick up on your idea, to multiply it, to copy it, to improve on it. So those are the 12 competencies that we have identified uh, this is an ongoing process. Uh, actually, we did this through feedback from our Aurora stakeholders. We had professors from the different Aurora universities give feedback here over the last year. Uh, we have run a pilot. We have uh, actually developed a measurement tool. So we have uh, uh, questions that students can answer. It's a self-assessment tool. So it, it's not quite as ideal as an objective measurement tool for those competencies would be. But it gives us an indication of where our students stand now and that allows us to uh, measure them again later and to see if there is actually a change in that uh, competence. So uh, that uh, the tool is still being developed. We're currently on a version dating back to July uh, this year, uh, but we will see further developments of that tool. Uh, and that is what we call the seismic scale, the seismic impact measurement tool. And what are we doing with this? Well, uh, first of all, we are testing it internally. I'm going to tell you in a minute about which CBS, excuse me, which Aurora universities are using the seismic tool. But actually, this is open again to other partners. So if you're interested to, to use this tool to find out whether your students are already possessing those skills or whether they are gaining them while they're studying with you, you can join the seismic uh, survey project. Uh, it can be for bachelor students, master students, uh, lifelong learning. And what you can do here is, and what we are doing, is we actually repeat this survey three times. We do this at the beginning of the autumn semester. We do it in the middle of the winter, which is basically when the semester is over. And then we do it next summer at the end of the spring or summer semester. So what that will allow us to do is to measure how over time these competencies, these 12 competencies that I just described, have changed in our students. Uh, and basically to see how good we are at creating those kind of competencies. Uh, a fourth element is what we call faculty development. We are uh, still developing this. This is uh, the next step in our project. We want to actually survey the professors and we want to ask the professors, do you know how to teach those competencies? Because not all of our colleagues know how to teach all of those 12 competencies. So uh, if you're interested, you're more than welcome to reach out to us. Again, email is the same one, aurora at cbs.dk. 
uh, just shoot us an email and we will let you know how you can use that survey in your own university if you like to to figure out whether your university is implementing those tools or not. Uh, you will get some data on these uh, on these tools. You will know uh, what we call the incoming competencies, so the competencies your students have at the beginning of the semester, and you can see the relative change in every semester. Uh, and then, of course, you can also look at the faculty level, at your professors. Do they think that this is important, right? Do I believe my students need a perspective-taking uh, um, uh, it's competence, right? Perhaps I, I teach geology, right? And it's, ah, it's not necessary to take perspective, right? Secondly, we ask the question, do you feel capable of teaching your students these skills, right? Perhaps I think that perspective taking is very important, but I never learned how to teach this, so I can't really teach it. And thirdly, we ask the professor whether they're actually teaching it. Perhaps I'm capable of teaching empathy. I feel I'm able of teaching empathy and perspective taking. But I don't do it because in the current courses that I'm doing, I simply don't have time. There's no possibility for me to have this in there. So what Seismic allows you to get is an overview of where your students stand and what they learn every semester. And also to see where your professors, your, your faculty, your teachers and lecturers are standing, whether they think these competences are important, whether they think that they're capable of teaching it, and whether they actually have time and possibility to do that. And that then allows you to find best practice examples that you can share with your faculty, uh, as well as, of course, you can mine the raw data that is coming back. Now, just to give you an idea here of what is needed to do this, typically, if uh, you want to do this at your school, you identify a contact person, uh, you identify which study programs you want to use this in, and as I said, this could be different levels, bachelor, master, lifelong learning. It could be in different domains, right? In Aurora, we have uh, domains such as culture, climate, digitalization, health, and other areas, right? So tell us where do you want to use this, and then you will send out the survey link before your semester starts, and through that you can collect that information. Now, uh, here's a little overview of where we stand with this project at the moment. So at Copenhagen Business School, we have sent out the survey to 18 bachelor and 43 master students. And uh, we're just getting in the first data. We will repeat this, as I said, at the end of the semester. And then again, at the end of the next semester, uh, we have also sent the survey to the University of Iceland, three bachelor program and 10 master programs, ranging across nursing, chemistry, innovation, entrepreneurship, midwifery, information management, and so on. And at the University of Innsbruck, we have covered, uh, again, different bachelor and master programs in teaching. Uh, in management economics, in engineering. And finally, at the University of Palatsky, we have covered law, social work, and economics and managerial studies. Now, uh, this is a pilot phase, so uh, we will see what we get back in terms of the data. We'll see what we learn. But as I said before, it's an open tool uh, that we want to make available to interested uh, educators. So if you want to use this, just let us know and we're happy to share our tool with you. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation already. Um, thank you very much. If you have questions, email us aurora at cbs.dk and we will get back to you with more information. And with this, I'm handing back to Anmai. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, and just to say to, to those that have uh, joined us, uh, we are recording this session because because of the multiple changes in the program on when this session would take place, we were, when we started, actually quite unsure if anyone would join us, so we decided to record the session um, and it will be distributed uh, afterwards so that people who, who've missed it and were interested can at least see it. Um, we had initially envisioned time for questions, um, but then when we thought nobody would show up, we just thought, let's just record it. But now that I see we've got a couple of people, um, I just wanted to give a quick opportunity for anyone who had any questions for Kai or for myself and um, for my presentation. I'll, I'll just see if there are any raised hands. Give a few seconds, no? Okay, then I'll, because people are joining a few, um, I'll give an opportunity for questions at the end of it then still to see if there's anyone who wants to ask any questions. But then now it's uh, Jaap um moment in the program to do his presentation. Thank you, Jaap. 
Okay, yeah, thank you, Anamai, for your introduction. Um, we are um, one of the four pilot domains, domains in Aurora. Um, our pilot domain is on digital society and global citizenship, and there we try to develop a truly European multi-university master, which is in Europe uh, quite uh, you know, innovative and, uh, and very new. Uh, the topic of digital society and global citizenship is rather broad, but we can all see the digital transformation that is currently going on everywhere in Europe, in the US, in Asia and so forth. Um, and its implication, global citizenship. And if we are not restricted anymore to our country or to our region, but um, we are all Europeans or even world citizens. And this is perhaps the most important change of the, the century. Um, the word digital implies uh, computer science. I am myself from the computer science faculty, but um, we see digital society and global citizenship, citizenship much broader. Uh, it's uh, a transdisciplinary uh, undertaking. Um, many other studies than computer science, AI, and so on are, uh, are also important uh, um, because many of the, the issues are um, what we call cross-cutting. Um, we all know uh, bias in, uh, in algorithms. Um, by the way, uh, algorithms in computer science mean something completely different than what you see in the news. So already that is a very different interpretation um, we have uh, work on artificial intelligence and in a relation to that ethics, uh, for example, relation uh, ethics on, on weapons or uh, self-driving cars, or that kind of stuff. Um, the political state of data is an important thing. My own research and what we contribute is about fair digital ecosystems and platforms. And we all know the, the big tech firms, but um, the question is, can we develop also platforms that are a bit more fairer? Um, and so on. And uh, finally, uh, we're also looking in our program to the digital divide in the global south. And we have here in, in Europe and the US and so on, um, all good access to, to IT and, and, and computer networks and so on. But in, in Africa, that is emerging, but certainly not at the same level as we have here in, in Europe or the US. So that makes it also an interesting challenge. Um, what you see, Bill, these topics is that it uh, is much, much more than only computer science or artificial intelligence. It's about ethics, it's about economics, it's about social sciences. Uh, law is very important. If you, for instance, look at the AO law, AO law that was uh, quite recently uh, developed in Europe. Um, so it's certainly not restricted to computer science only. Um, the second argument actually for for having a, a master program on digital society and global citizenship is that we are convinced that at least there should be a European perspective. Um, this is a worldwide uh, audience, I suppose. So preferably, I would like to have a worldwide point of view on it. But let's be honest, our funding is from the European Commission. So we um, restrict ourselves uh, in, in Aurora to the European perspective. But if you want to participate from the US or so on, you're more than welcome uh, to join us. Um, and why do we do it? Because the challenges that I mentioned uh, at the previous bullet point are uh, can be only addressed, we think, at the European or even worldwide level. Um, and there are, of course, useful initiatives in, in European countries themselves about digital society and global citizenship. But most problems, most challenges uh, have a, a cross-European uh, context and, uh, and setting. And um, as Anna May already explained, um, part of Aurora is also um, implementing the sustainable development goals of the United Nations in educational programs. So uh, most of the challenges we are considering in the digital society and global citizenship um, is um, actually about uh, the SDGs, not all, all of them, but most. Um, what we propose is the following, a, a two-year EU master on the topic of digital society and global citizenship. And for Europe, this is quite unique because it means one European diploma and one European accreditation. And this um, is an implementation of what Anamai already introduced, namely the European University. Uh, the European Com uh, Commission is interested in the European uh, University and, of course, a European university comes with European degrees, and this is uh, one of them, um, which is a, a, a master degree. 
it's uh, as already indicated, I uh, multidisciplinary master because the challenges are not uh, restricted to a, a particular discipline like computer science or economics, but are cross-cutting. And uh, consequently, the master that we develop will be open uh, to a broad range of, of uh, bachelor uh, students. Uh, for example, from social sciences, economics, humanities, uh, law, computer science, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, mathematics, and so on. Um, so we think that uh, we can accommodate a very broad range of uh, uh, students that can start the Europe program. Um, we look mainly also at sustainability um, or in relation to digital society and global citizenship and fairness. Um, we think that um, the European Commission can distinguish itself from, uh, from others with respect to this topic, specifically in, in relation to what we call fair ecosystems and platforms. Um, and finally, the master will be uh, research oriented. Um, we need practitioners in the field on the topic of digital society and global citizenship. And in a, a few minutes, I will tell you where we think our ingredients can work. Um, but certainly we also need um, uh, scientific people, um, for example, um, master students that can do a follow up uh, in the form of a PhD uh, project. Um, so um, the, the, the master has also a uh, strong uh, research orientation. Um, not all our universities, universities participate in this, uh, but we have six universities that uh, will work on this uh, new master. Uh, Federico Secundo in Naples, uh, Palatsky in uh, Olomouc, the University of Innsbruck, the University of Iceland, the uh, University of Rovira in Terracona, and uh, finally, uh, my own university, the Vrijnvestheid in uh, Amsterdam. Um, where will um, graduates of this uh, program work? Um, well, in, in general, they will have a management policy type of positions, but also scientific positions in um, the field of digital society and global citizenship. Um, some examples, for example, uh, business development uh, for uh, platforms for hopefully a bit fairer platforms, for example, and platforms like Spotify, Netflix, and Uber. Um, policy offers, we think that the European Union itself or the European Commission itself is actually an important employer for uh, students of this program. Um, international advisors in the field of uh, ICT and, and the consequences of ICT, uh, regulation designers, eh? so a lot of European law has to be designed and uh, that law should, on the one hand, be, um, let's say, realistic, but on the other hand, also is usually about IT. Uh, for example, the uh, recent AI law in uh, Europe, um, digital historians, and of course, uh, researchers. Um, we think our program is rather unique. Um, there are some national initiatives uh, in Europe, um, specifically at the bachelor level. Um, but as I argued, we really think that um, the topic of digital society and global citizenship should be addressed at the international level, in this case at the European level, but preferably even worldwide. And uh, second, we see that many of these programs um, that claim to work on digital society um, are often based uh, in a certain home discipline, for instance, computer science, or social sciences, or some other discipline, and what you typically see with those programs is that they have a certain bias to the home discipline. So, for example, uh, computer science plus a few additional courses from other disciplines. And what we want to do is to offer a really balanced program um, in terms of technical and non-technical aspects of the uh, digital technology and global citizenship. So the balance is here very important. Um, the, uh, the, the program will be uh, hence integrated interdisciplinary, so students will really be taught in an interdisciplinary way. In a minute, I'll show you how we do that um, with sustainable value based content. Um, and one of the things uh, that we uh, think is important is uh, that students can take a sort of design perspective on the problem. So, for example, designing IT. 
but also designing business and also designing law, for, exa uh, for example, um, that consists of, uh, let's say, critical analysis, synthesis, and, 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 and debate. Um, and what we will offer at the end of the day is a formalized EU international joint degree. There are a few of these degrees right now in uh, Europe. So this is uh, one of, will be one of the first programs that delivers really one European degree with one European accreditation. And one of the things we are struggling with is how to ensure that the program is really multidisciplinary. Uh, or to put it differently, how do you avoid that the program is only single monodisciplinary plus perhaps a few appendices? And we have looked, of course, at programs that already are running the multidisciplinary European master programs. There are a few of them. Um, one interesting um, suggestion they gave us was to not only select students that enter the grow program, for example, on their motivation or other criteria, but also to select them on for the discipline that they come from. Uh, to put it differently, you don't want to have uh, 100 students for economics and 20 from computer science. It should be balanced in some way. So some of the multidisciplinary comes from the distribution of the students and where they come from. Um, we will start with a uh, 30 credit points um, project portfolio where the goal is to, um, let's say, make sure that at the end of this 30 credit points, students have, um, let's say, um, comparable, compatible backgrounds. Um, in practice, that means that a student coming from law needs to learn some computer science and economics and a student from computer science perhaps needs to learn something from law and social sciences. And then the core of the curriculum is uh, 60 European credit points of courses, so that roughly corresponds to one year of study. And those um, courses will be uh, centered around um, SDG-oriented themes. Um, and um, if you look at the definition of all the sustainable development goals, this actually inherently applies uh, multidisciplinarity. Um, and also the courses will be taught by a multidisciplinary teaching theme. We think it's very difficult to find one particular teacher that can teach one course. In contrast, um, we want to develop teaching teams or we develop teaching teams with teachers that cover very, very different disciplines. And by that means we, that we think we can bring really truly multidisciplinary education. And finally, there will be a research seminar and that's a challenge by itself because if you look at um, the various disciplines that exist, um, all these disciplines come with their own very different research methodologies. So one of the challenges that we have is to come up with an integrated research approach that brings together all the different research approaches and philosophies of the various disciplines we teach. Um, this is really a very interesting uh, problem. Um, in sum, the program looks at follows. So we have the first, we have these 30 European credit points so roughly half a year on uh, personal multidisciplinary projects. Then we have the core of the curriculum, which is 60 credit points, one year, where we have different digital challenge teams that we address, for example, the energy transition, um, uh, the division between uh, poor and, and, and rich people in the world, and so forth. We will have a research seminar um, where we address multidisciplinary research methods and, let's say, integrating monodisciplinary research methods into uh, multidisciplinary variants. There can be an internship, and at the end of the day, there is a 30 credit point, so half year, master of science project where students have to do their individual project. Here is some overview of the themes you're thinking about. Uh, for example, algorithms and bias in judgment and decision making. You can all, uh, I think you all have an understanding of this. Um, artificial intelligence and ethics. Uh, politics of data, uh, I already explained fair digital ecosystems and platforms, um, and the digital device in the global south. So these are themes that we probably will address in the master. Um, you'll see already uh, immediately that these are very multidisciplinary topics. Yeah? For example, digital divide in the global south goes to a certain extent about information technology because 
only um, uh, specific kinds of IT components can work there, but it also has uh, so social and societal uh, consequences if you are going to introduce information technology in the global south. So in sum, what we propose is a truly European research-oriented Master of Science program um, in the uh, field of digital society and global citizenship addressing the SDGs or uh, the global challenges. Um, if you want to have more information about this program or perhaps you want to deliver a course or to participate, here is my email address. Um, you can contact me and um, we will can have a conversation via email. Thanks for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Jaap. And um, now we are going to switch to Maurice. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Um, so good to see you, every, everybody. Um, I will uh, go to my um, presentation. Um, my presentation will be about, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Um, I will, my presentation will be about the, the Aurora SG uh, Research Dashboard. Um, here with this dashboard, uh, we try to answer basically uh, two questions. Um, what kind of research that we do uh, are related to societal challenges? Um, and the other one is, um, uh, is our research for these societal challenges actually making any impact on society? So those are the, is the breadth thread through this, this presentation, uh, where why we built this uh, dashboard. Um, uh, I, I'm only giving this presentation, but we built this dashboard together with uh, other people from the Aurora network. Uh, these are um, uh, the, the team uh, teammates that we, uh, that, uh, that we built this with. Um, and uh, yeah, to, to give a, a first um, a layer uh, of, of, uh, of understanding, is that we um, uh, use the Aurora um, collaborative statement uh, to define or to create this dashboard, to create the different parts of the dashboard. So um, it says here that Aurora, that's on the website for, or for Aurora, is a partnership of like-minded and closely collaborating research-intensive European universities who use their academic excellence to drive social societal change and contribute to the society, uh, sustainable development goals. So if we, uh, I put this in numbers to, uh, to create proxy uh, indicators for measuring each uh, one of these um, statements that we uh, make uh, and put this uh, together, create data around it and uh, give it, make a dashboard. So what we understand with research intensive is for example, the number of publications uh, that, uh, that, that universities produce uh, each year. Um, and the academic excellence is the, the field-weighted citation impact uh, as an indicator for academic excellence for, for, um, uh, for citations, but then weighted for every field. And uh, drive societal change, we try to uh, measure in how open is that, that research? Uh, is it used in policy documents? Is it used in patents? And is it used in, in news? Um, and then uh, the other one is sustainable development goals. We want to uh, segment or to filter these uh, publications into uh, the SDGs. And that's also the tricky part. So um, this is a peak of the SDG dashboard. Uh, what you see here uh, is the number of publications for each of the universities. And um, in the uh, colored green, is uh, you see at the top uh, left bar is that 61% uh, uh, of the Aurora publications are related to the SDGs. Maurice, sorry to interrupt, but we don't yes. see your uh, slides, or at least I don't. Hmm. That's too bad. <laughs> uh, Maybe try again. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, where's the. It's the green arrow yeah. share screen at the bottom. Oh, you, you missed uh, a lot of slides then. Sorry about that. Here you go. I guess now you can see it. Yes, though so you have to yeah. do the full screen um, button. Yeah. So yeah, perfect. Thank you. This one, here's the link. 
<laughs> the bit.ly link. Um, if you type it over, you, can, you uh, will go to the, uh, the uh, website of the dashboard. Um, this is the team. Uh, these are the four points, the research intensi int intensity, uh, academic excellence, societal change, and SDGs. So these are the indicators that we try to use uh, as a proxy to uh, uh, evaluate each of these um, uh, uh, statements. Uh, and this is the slide where I was. So at the top corner, Yes, you can see here, 61% uh, of the publications um, are related to one or more of the SDGs. Um, I come back how we uh, how we did this uh, later on. Um, here you can see um, for each of the SDGs um, what the uh, relative contribution is for each university. Uh, for example, here Duisburg Essen uh, has produced uh, 12,000 publications related to clean water and sanitation, and that makes up of uh, almost 15% of the total output of Duisburg Essen. Um, but uh, if, if uh, universities uh, delivered their organizational structure, we can also drill down into, uh, into the faculties uh, and see, for example, here uh, uh, from uh, URV, uh, the Faculty of Architecture is, uh, uh, has 22 publications related to um, uh, sustainable cities and communities, for example. So um, the, the other one is um, about um, co-author co collaboration because we, we uh, publish in a international context, not only within Aurora amongst each other, but also uh, with other um, uh, universities across the globe. And here we can see, for example, uh, if, if um, uh, where we have co-published with um, um, uh, institutes that are uh, related to, that are in uh, landlocked developed countries, developing countries, um, and you can here for, see, for example, that uh, uh, that um, um, the the the, 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 the um, research done is primarily on on energy uh, on on uh, uh, on on energy the sustainable and clean energy. Um, here is the, the research excellence. Uh, this is the field weighted citation impact uh, where we can see uh, for each SDG ranked, uh, uh, for example, here in the top 10% um, uh, field weighted uh, citation impact, um, uh, how many publications are in there and how, how that relates to the, to the other uh, buckets. Um, and um, here uh, we can see, for example, the open accessibility, how, uh, how open uh, our publications are. Um, and in the top bar, you can see that the most publications uh, are open, but a lot of uh, publications are still closed. And you can see which SDGs they uh, are made up. Um, and here you can see the distribution over time. Um, here, this is also an interesting one, uh, the policy citations. So that means that um, uh, we found uh, what, what, what this database does. Um, it looks into the references of the policy documents, the PDFs of governments uh, that they've made uh, and refer to research uh, and uh, link that to the publications that we have in this dashboard. And so we can see, for example, um, uh, if we select uh, uh, the policy impact that we made uh, in governments in the least developed uh, countries, um, the publication uh, uh, governments have, have used our publications uh, in, in those uh, countries. Um, and the most are on, uh, for example, SG 13 uh, on climate action. Um, then uh, when we uh, are interested in combining those two factors, for example, research excellence and uh, societal uh, impact in, in terms of the policy citations. Uh, we can see, for example, the impact un untapped potential. So here is SEG uh, 9. Um, and uh, uh, SEG 9 uh, is about industry and innovation and infrastructure. There is a lot of um, uh, um, uh, publications, uh, field uh, it's a high number uh, of uh, field weighted citation impact uh, publications in there, uh, but they are uh, relatively uh, below the average of the other SDGs uh, in making, make it, making it into policy. 
So this is uh, something that um, uh, universities from Aurora could tap into and to see, uh, seek out how they can promote that kind of uh, excellent research to uh, policymakers. So the objective uh, for our uh, SG dashboard is uh, how to turn uh, the SDGs into leading narrative for the uh, uh, for research in, into the Aurora Alliance, and we want to do this by uh, creating this dashboard, uh, making it an operational tool uh, that uh, uh, people can use, and uh, making it also available for other universities and networks. So this is the project timeline. Um, basically, we created uh, 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 queries. Uh, to, to see what, which publications belong to each SDG. Uh, we evaluated this. Then we created a, a, a classification uh, model uh, to classify text. Then we want to create a classification service so you can, you can use it online. Then we want to classify all our publications. Then we put this into the dashboard and make it open uh, for everybody. Uh, so for example, uh, this is the classification service, how it looks like. Um, uh, you put in uh, some text. Uh, this is German text, and it comes up with uh, um, uh, the different um, uh, scores for each of the SDGs. And you can put this into a wheel, and that you can put this onto a website, for as an example, to to uh, to to notify uh, people where this publication is about, on uh, where is relevant for which SDG. So, um, and we we. Uh, I suppose to talk about the struggles that we had, and um, uh, because that's that's the remaining time uh, I have. Um, so what we tried to do, uh, we could go for the easy road and take uh, commercial services that are out there, um, like uh, Web of Science and Scopus or Dimensions or whatever, uh, to um, get uh, the data and uh, get the SDG classifications for our publications and uh, be over it. But uh, we decided not to do this because it, those uh, databases only represent the English uh, publications and have a, a strong selection procedure. So does does uh, uh, so forty percent of our publications is not in those databases. So we wanted to represent all our publications in there, um, and uh, therefore uh, we had to use a different method. Uh, so we we needed to get publications for from our repositories, catalogs, uh, and research information systems. And uh, that took months to get that data and to get sorted out. Uh, the second one issue is um, these publications, they are not in English and the classification systems out there uh, for SDGs, they are um, uh, uh, they're built for English texts. Um, so we had to invent or create a, a new um, uh, classifier uh, that uh, uh, that can work for all, all the other languages uh, that we have. Uh, so um, using using a tip from the computational uh, linguistic researchers here at the VU, we um, uh, use this uh, AI model um, uh, also built for, with uh, um, with the help of Google and, and Facebook. Um, and retrain these for the SDGs. Um, so, and then there are a lot of a number of issues uh, to, to get over with. Um, we need to get a large quantities of training, train, training data. Uh, we have, um, uh, yeah, we, we get, we get uh, the Scopus data, but then there are uh, issues with, with the limitations and we need to create a partnership with Elsevier, for example, to get the data in um, and, uh, uh, so, and then you need to know uh, how good is that that uh, that um, the model that you have made. You have to evaluate with. Uh, we've evaluated this with uh, 244 senior researchers across the European uh, University Network. Um, so there are a lot of struggles uh, along the way uh, to get this far, as we have done uh, now. Um, and um, and also what uh, what Jaap mentions is ethics about using AI. Um, uh, so um, uh, we, we make we make it as, as transparent as possible uh, with the data and the methods that we've used, uh, and also to evaluate the, the the models and put those numbers online, open, available for everybody, and also to to, to recheck and uh, re reproduce uh, our work, uh, but also to um, explicitly mention to 
um, people who want to use the dashboard to, uh, for research evaluation to not to do this explicitly. Um, so don't evaluate uh, uh, universities or, or faculties or, or departments or even researchers uh, based on, on, on these uh, models. Um, um, then there is an issue uh, to design the dashboard uh, for fit for use. So we want to investigate uh, who are the people who want to use this uh, dashboard and for what. We send out a survey uh, to investigate more in that. Uh, we send it out to uh, the university's uh, policy office, the grant office, communication office, research managers, etc. Uh, and we try to adjust the, the design of the dashboard accordingly uh, to their information needs. Um, then there is an issue about, uh, uh, is it gonna be used, the dashboard? Um, so do we want, to, uh, we want to make sure that people are familiar with the dashboard? Uh, and there is a communication uh, and instruction guides that uh, will help with, uh, with, with the uptake of the dashboard. Then there is problem of um, the replication and rebuilding. Um, that's, uh, uh, so so we, we wanted to build this thing in a way uh, as transparent and openly as possible so others can uh, duplicate uh, and copy our uh, results so they can uh, build their own dashboards for their own purposes. Um, and uh, we open source every step uh, along the way. So that's methods, evaluation, uh, data, code, software, et cetera, uh, and make guides for developers. So that's, uh, that's upcoming. Um, and then there is also an issue on uh, sustainability of project results. So now we've built this one thing. Um, how do we make sure that uh, it's being kept up to date year after year? Um, and therefore, we um, entered a, a strategic partnership with Open Air uh, to uh, move towards an, um, the open research information infrastructures and connect our system with the existing European research infrastructure. Um, and this, uh, in this uh, case, is Open Air uh, to put everything, all data, uh, in that uh, one platform, and everybody uh, needs to uh, uh, keeps their systems uh, updated automatically. Um, so these are our struggles in that. Um, so this is the partnership with Open Air. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's about knowledge exchange and using their, their services and integrating uh, data with their systems. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Maurice. Then last but certainly not least, Dario. Here I am. Thank you very much for this introduction and May. I'm going to share my uh, screen. Um, it is working? Yeah. Okay, hello everybody. I'm going to present the Aurora pilot domain that deals with sustainability and climate change. It is one of the four domain in which Aurora project is um, organized. Uh, just let me uh, mention the, those people that are at the guidance of this domain, uh, that are Bernard Fugenschu from University of Innsbruck and Annie Melkonian Gottschalk from uh, um, University of Duisburg Essen. Uh, I am the, uh, with my colleague Anna Maria Zaccaria, the referent person from the University of Naples uh, for this uh, domain. So, uh, sorry to uh, uh, replicate some arguments that were mentioned in the previous presentation. Uh, just a few words about the vision that, of course, also our domain uh, share with the overall project. Uh, we are going to think uh, to enact students as change agents. So basically, we are trying to imagine an uh, educational program that will be able uh, to share with the students a capacity to intervene, to be responsible, and to act in a scenario in which complexity is the main issue, the main future. Then we are going to construct an educational space 
with a recognized mobility for all. This means a very democratic European space and an inclusive uh, European educational space in which uh, all the uh, students coming from the different university uh, can have access uh, to different educational paths, to different uh, uh, scientific fields. Um, then we have also this uh, emphasis on the access to digital services. Uh, unfortunately, because the pandemic, but we have learned that uh, online teaching, online learning activities could be sometimes a good solution in order to share uh, courses and learning units also uh, among very distant places. At the same time, digital services means the access, for example, for a library or material um, learning materials, and this could be provided by the um, by working on tools like European, European Student Card on Europass. In other terms, we are trying to <laughs> open a space in which uh, knowledge could be shared and accessible. Uh, and finally, there is this uh, attempt about this domain to create a common course catalog. What does this mean? Basically, we are trying to uh, construct a course catalog coming from learning units and courses that are provided from the universities that are participating to the Alliance of Aurora. Uh, and the students will be able, of course, with a, a good guidance, uh, to pick and choose those courses, those learning units that are interesting for them in order to construct a very robust and strong um, educational profile. I will be more specific in the, the next slides about this. Uh, the aim, the general aim of the domain, provide an innovative, transdisciplinary, multicultural educational program dealing with the environmental issue. Uh, please let's stress this kind of concept that are transdisciplinary and environmental issue. There is a very strong connection between these two words. And then equip students with skills and minds that needed to take responsibility and initiative in their work and life, as well as to take the societal problems, societal and environmental problems. What does this mean? This means that we are trying to uh, transfer to our students, not only the knowledge about the world or how it works, but also to be active citizen in a, a very challenging world. And we are uh, aware that uh, times are very struggling. Uh, we are facing different problems, different issues, uh, starting from the environmental issues, but also in terms of geopolitical uh, troubles. So we need people that could be active citizens in this kind of world. Let me, a little bit academic, recalling this very well-known well uh, rainbow chart uh, that comes from the studies of Funtodit and Ravets about the post-normal science. If the scenario is made of uh, a very complex situation in which determinism related to the reductionism of each field of science can't be the solution, we need to learn how to teach our disciplines, our uh, science, uh, uh, in order to be combined, in order to be transdisciplinary. Uh, just to sum up this uh, chart for the, those that are not familiar with this, uh, in a very linear model of science, we have low system uncertainties and the and very low decision stakes. This means that it's enough to apply science, to be technical, to solve problems that are clearly detectable. Then there is a middle uh, situation that is that one in which uh, system uncertainties increase a little bit as, a, as well as the decision stakes. So this means values and interest in the decision. In that case, a professional consultancy could be useful in order to resolve, to solve problems and also to pacify the different stakeholders that present their values. When we deal with sustainability, climate change, ecological crisis, we have very different points uh, 
to, to put together. We have very different interests. We have very different epistemological uh, trajectories that are detecting this kind of problems. And the uncertainties of the systems are completely high. In that case, the linear model that was uh, in modernity the dominant one, science provides truth to power, to politics, is not enough. We have to rebundle the knowledge. We need to connect, uh, connect uh, paradigms of knowledge and also uh, the voice of those that are not in the field of knowledge, the so-called lay persons, but also those that are interested in uh, the, the so-called stakeholders that are interested in this, in this decision. So let, this is a very <laughs> naive sketch that I made. We are going from a very ordinate but linear mode of um, uh, knowledge application, let me say in this way, uh, that was the normal world in which disciplines were separated, segmented, and that they were governing their own fields in an actual complexity in which we require interconnection, dialogue, and transdisciplinary. This is the post-normal world in which we are called to learn and to teach uh, our students. Uh, the domain of uh, uh, sustainability and climate change is going to construct uh, this joint program among these uh, different universities that you are listed in the bottom of the slide. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, uh, experimented this first part. Uh, I don't know if you can see the mouse that I'm moving. I don't think so. Anyway, the first box, Heart and Earth. Uh, the first box is... Uh, uh, the box that we are experimenting uh, that is made uh, of two uh, courses. Uh, the first one is sustainability and climate change, and the other one is social entrepreneurship and innovation focusing on sustainability and climate change. These two boxes are basically made of courses coming from different universities and different uh, scientific fields. Then in the, in the next months, we will uh, construct uh, the other two boxes that are called uh, the, the second one hands-on in which we will enlist uh, practice-oriented learning un units and then finally we will construct the head a list of uh, course catalog in which theory-based learning units will enlist. Why the first one is based on a um, uh, an assemblage of uh, learning units that is right uh, now uh, functioning. People are going to enroll in these courses in the next, uh, uh, in these days. Uh, the other two have to be constructed. Uh, and in that case, people will be able to pick and choice, I, uh, as I say, pick and choice their own preference, uh, preference on learning units in order to construct this part in the joint program. This is uh, a very simple way to, um, to depict what happened in the first box, in the first uh, uh, joint course that we are experimenting. Uh, we, you can see uh, this uh, cloud, uh, this word cloud that uh, is come out from all the learning objectives detailed in the uh, joint course. You can see how, of course, um, some words are very overlapping in the different um, uh, disciplines that uh, are surrounding all the issues that we are going to teach. This means that we are focusing on the same field of issues throughout different field of science. This is, from my point of view, I suppose also yours, <laughs> uh, transdisciplinary. We are focusing on the issue from different perspective. And this is a very uh, uh, challenging experiment because we have to share uh, a catalog of concept, of categories, of understanding, 
afford what we are going to teach to our uh, students. What is the qualification profile we are working uh, uh, on? Well, this is a very uh, ongoing work because, of course, this depends on how the course, the joint course, will be uh, structured in the next months. But uh, in the last uh, meeting of the domain, we agreed about this. Uh, that is an excerpt of the text about these points. Graduates, uh, we know how the background, the structure of the 17 sustainable SDGs. Um, could be uh, understood in holistically terms and not to split these arguments in ecological or economic or social or biophysical perspective. This means that we, are, we will be able to reconnect societal problems in the different ecosystem in which we are going to detect, detect the issues. Then graduates can develop creative solution to sustainability and climate change in a transdisciplinary way. This means that our students will be able to, you know, to, to, uh, to assemblage uh, different kind of knowledge in order to detect specific solution to specific problems. And finally, graduates will be able to implement and disseminate innovation in a collaborative, international, and in cultural manner. This is, of course, uh, a, a leading principle of all the projects of Aurora. Uh, but uh, of course, also for us, is very important because the international cooperation among students. This means that, for example, students will elaborate uh, working group together. Uh, and this, of course, is important to uh, develop a, a, a multicultural and uh, international uh, way of thinking. Uh, this point is very important for our qualification profile. Of course, there are issues in doing what we are doing, and these issues need to be uh, addressed in a way. Uh, the first one is that the challenge of transdisciplinary uh, is a very theoretically uh, frequent argument that we uh, meet in a policy document, in the intention uh, of institution, but need to be practiced. And when we practice <laughs> transdisciplinary, uh, we need the construction of a basic common lexicon for uh, reciprocal understanding. Uh, just uh, make, to, to make an example, in the last meeting, we spent a, a few minutes about uh, what scalarity means in different fields of uh, science. And this is just an example to, to, to share with you how complex sometimes it is to put together uh, knowledge about an issue or a field of uh, similar issues. Then we have the problem of the different uh, procedures of learning accountability and assessment of learning units. Each university, of course, have established procedures and formal procedures uh, to uh, uh, account for or assess uh, the learning uh, outcome of the students. We are going to work about this because sometimes uh, heterogeneity uh, is uh, it's very difficult to be uh, managed in order to have a, a common space of learning units in Europe. Um, then we have to uh, take in serious account the issue of inclusive manage management of cultural and linguistic diversity. I have to say that, that the problem is more on the linguistic point on the linguistic side, because, of course, we are going to use English in this moment to understand uh, each other. But uh, one of the aim of our project is to recognize the dignity of all the languages of the alliance as tool of communication of science. And so we, we need to address this kind of problem of multilingual uh, part of education. And Aurora, uh, uh, have people and the work package uh, devoted to this kind of challenge. Yes, but what we are practicing and learning. 
uh, in these months of uh, uh, project. We are going to, <laughs> to, to practice <laughs> Uh, this kind of dream or enduring promise of transdisciplinarity. We are translating, a, 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 yes, epistemologies, that means a way of knowing, knowing the world, to take care of complexity in practice, not only in theory. Of course, this is a very difficult uh, challenge. Uh, this is a sort of Babylon, Babylonian tower sometimes in which people try to put all the efforts, but have to learn to understand the others and learn not on simple matters, but on complexity. And this is a very practical issue. We need to learn in practice how to deal with these theoretical issues that are uh, well declared in official statement and documents. And then we are uh, interlacing heterogeneous facts and values in the name of an alliance for dwelling the common earth. We are basically reconnecting the soft story of climate change and sustainability that is made of politics, that is made of values, that is made of point of views, with all the very material, very strong science side of the story that is made of facts, that is made of metrics, that is made of quantitative uh, um, strategies of accountability. In rec reconnecting these two spheres, we are trying to detect a way in order to provide a, an educational path for this alliance for dwelling the common earth that is basically the unique earth that we and the future generation will be dwelling in. Thank you very much. And finish. Thank you so much, Dario, for your presentation. Um, just to repeat for those who joined us uh, after two o'clock Central and Eastern European time is that we there was some mix up on the organizational side about when we would do this session and it was never properly communicated so we started at two but we decided to uh, record the entire session because we actually didn't think anyone would know the proper time and join and i think looking at who has joined uh, during the session that was the right call to actually um, record it so since we do have a couple of people here, I just wanted to leave room for a second to see if anyone wanted to raise their hand and ask any questions, realizing full well that most of you haven't seen the entire session and to say that we will be sharing the recording and the slides afterwards. So you'll be able to look at uh, the full recording and the slides at your leisure. Um, but just wanted to give an opportunity for anyone who wants to maybe raise their hand and ask any questions to any of the speakers. But I don't see any hands raised. So, well, that basically, oh, wait, something's happening in a chat. Uh, oh, no, so sharing links. Yeah, that's fine. Um, then all there is left for me to do is really to thank our speakers um, very, very much for taking the time to do this, even though um, the, the organizational side of things wasn't um, was a bit subpar, uh, but I'm happy that we did it together and happy that we have a recording that we can share with everyone who's interested afterwards. So thank you very much to Kai, to Yap, to Dario and to Maurice uh, for joining us today and doing the presentation with us. And um, yeah, everyone else have a lovely day and um, yeah, the recording and everything will be sent to you. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, see you at the next one. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.